name is John Fraze, I'm the head of global labor strategy at Ankara, and we are here for another No Suits, No Slides. I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Gilbertson, who's the vice president of UKG, and I've got Chris Mullen, the executive director of the Workforce Institute, as well as Kylie Zank from UKG, who's a specialist in manufacturing. And we're here to talk about gratitude for the frontline workforce. This all started with a blog post that Kylene wrote that got a lot of press because, first of all, it was done in April, right, mm -hmm. uh, right after the start of the pandemic. And secondly, um, it brought up things that became major headlines later about are we really understanding what everybody else is going through out there and how do we show gratitude? So can you start by telling us how'd you come up with this thing and what's it all about? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously in March, 2020, our world's changed completely. Um, I was sent home and to work from home and as the rest of us were, most of us are just still going back in the office, but I realized that so many of our clients that work in manufacturing or other essential organizations, those employees were still working, going to the, going to the plants, going to the hospitals. And I thought it was really important that we take a moment and recognize the, the work that they were all doing to make sure the rest of us had the things we need to live our lives safely at home. Whether that's the food we eat, the medicines that we, we take, the computers we're doing our work on, right, all of those things. So yeah, I just took a moment to, to write a post just to say thank you and, and show appreciation for that. And I think it's something that's that's super critical and we need to continue to do. And it's, it's something we're terrible at when there's not a pandemic or when there is a pandemic. And um, Chris Mullen is somebody that I terrorize regularly about um, something that he talks about in almost every speech that he gives, which is creating moments that matter for employees. And again, it's not just about a pandemic. It, these are people that work hard every day to provide the goods and services that we all consume. And yeah. so Chris, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we know I spend a lot of time as director of HR overseeing and supporting frontline workers in dining facilities. And I always felt like that personal touch was the moment that mattered. You know, there are some times where we can, and a lot of times where we can improve their employee experience through policy, but sometimes it's just the relational piece of it. How do we, how do we create that connection with someone? And, and I try and do this in my everyday, even for folks I don't work with. Like when I go to the grocery store, my kids make fun of me. I know everyone's name. <laughs> like I know, the, I know the manager, the assistant manager, and I know everyone at a register. Um, and, and I do that because I, I feel like it's honorable work and they deserve to be recognized and thanked. And, and I see them, well, I have four kids. I see them every day yeah. <laughs> at the supermarket every day. And so I want to be able to do something even as simple as that. that that's building a relationship with someone. Those moments where they don't forget these things. And, you know, there are limits to this. I talk to people on elevators. Like, mm -hmm. maybe that's too much. <laughs> right? That's not as helpful. But, Dave, UKG is famous for the culture that's been created there at every level. Without making this a UKG advertisement, um, are there some things that, that UKG does differently to create that kind of impact? Yeah, I think the number one thing that I've seen, at least, that uh, you don't see at a lot of other companies is just it is completely genuine. Right. If if you're gonna have this this sense of going out and treating people with, with respect and providing more flexibility, really putting yourself in their shoes before you come up with uh, some policies, and it sounds crazy, but ask their opinion. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like that's something that UKG has, has done very very naturally. I haven't seen a lot of other companies do, um, and that's where I think just to take on on what Kylie was saying. So what she was writing about in April of 2020. Fast forward now 18 months. Not a lot of companies have done well at this, That's right. right? If you look at, uh, there's been a lot, a lot of news out there around the Great Resignations. We've talked about on each of these other sessions. We got some really interesting data within, uh, within our halls, and you look at who's actually retiring over the last uh, 18 months. It's uh, in large part women, more women than men that are that yeah. are that are leaving the workforce. And it's uh, folks that are between the ages of 25 to 34, right in their kind of family insanity years. And it's folks that are 45 to 54. And that's in both, for both men and women. And if you look at the kinds of pressures that are being undertaken at those specific ages, boy, if some of, if some of the companies out there could just take a more human approach and start to think more uh, robustly about what kind of uh, what kind of benefits they're offering, how they're treating their employees, 
he would be able to get a lot of those folks to come back. There's about four million employees out there that have left the workforce and have not yet come back even though the jobs are out there. So I think that'd be one of my follow-up questions for both of you is what can companies do to get really practical about addressing this exactly? How can they treat folks and, be, and before we answer this, two stats on that. And you're the king of statistics on this. <laughs> like 45 to 54, like it's, that's an amazing statistic. It matters. And we, if we can actually figure out exactly where this is happening, we can work on fixing it. Yep. But when we, and we've talked about this in the first four of these we did, but when we talk to hourly employees, 33% of them say that the management team communicates well. Yeah. That means 67% say no. <laughs> right. And then 39% say the management team actually cares about them. 61% mm -hmm. say no. So these are major numbers, right? I mean, very negative. They like a lot of things. They love their jobs. They love the people they work with. The management piece is a problem. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'll jump on that. I think Chris talked about making it personal. And I think that's the piece that's missing in a lot of um, essential frontline organizations. It's about creating a connection between employees and the manager. And it's as simple as stopping and talking to your staff and asking them how they're doing. Um, I've been watching Ted Lasso over the um, <laughs> pandemic. What's that? And, 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 yeah, so I think everybody knows what Ted Lasso is. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the leadership qualities that Ted has, you know, one of the things he says all the time is his people are, I appreciate you. And yeah. I, I bet if you were to ask the average employee in manufacturing, when was the last time someone even said something like that? They, would, they wouldn't remember. It's, it's warehouse, distribution, logistics, manufacturing, mining, call centers. We're not supposed to say thank you. You come in, you do your job, and that's it. You know, we do have some multi-million dollar programs in place <laughs> with 25 steps that you go through. But thank you, that's not going to move the needle. And that's simply not true. Thank you is maybe the most powerful thing you can say. They don't get it. No, and, and getting to know them on from a manager perspective, I do believe the manager is the linchpin for any corporate process, culture, even, even in UKG. Mm -hmm. it, it, if you, your CEO, your C-suite can say whatever they want about the culture, but if it doesn't permeate to the manager and then the manager believe it and actually do it, doesn't matter. It, it, right. it, it, won't, it won't make it to the frontline worker. And so for me, it's not just the, the relationship of a thank you, that's, that's great and that, that is a big piece of it, but it's, do I know you? I mean, do I know when your birthday is? Do I know when your work anniversary is? These are things now, there's, there's software out there to help you do that. Sure. When, I was a, when I was a manager, I mean, I still am, but 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I had to actually like take the time and write this in my calendar. <laughs> how, many, how many employees did you have? Uh, a lot, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, like to over 2,000. And so I always wanted to know when it was someone's birthday. And, and one of the ways I, got, I did that, and this, this goes to the frontline workers because they're not working remote, is I would walk around the facilities of the university and I would say hello, introduce myself if they were new to me. Mm -hmm. And I would, and then once they knew who I was and that word started to spread, he actually, when he says, how are you doing? He actually means it. Right. Yeah. I'll start to remember kids' names, maybe not their names, but that you have kids. So <laughs> I've got four kids of my own and I can't even remember their names. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> Let's go there. But, um, but the, the idea that, do I know these small things about you? And then start to build on that as a manager because then that shows that it starts to build trust, it builds the relationship, and it, and it knows even though if I may mess up as a manager, I have your best interest in mind at heart. Like, there's no doubt that folks uh, would understand that, that look, even if I mess up, it, it, I'm still trying to do what's right, yeah. and I'll apologize for it. It's great transparency. And, and once they know, once you walk around, once people start to know, I didn't even have to introduce myself to people. Like, I would, hit the, I would go to the dining hall, the, you know, walk through uh, where the custodians were cleaning, they would just come and you, you really know what your culture is like because they'll tell you. Right. It's funny, right. you know, in, our, in the last video we did, we were talking about how important it is for corporations to behave the way you're talking about how managers should behave. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got to know your communities. Yep. You've got to interact. There's a couple of things, and you know, Dave is an excellent communicator, that when, they, when employees tell us they don't, management doesn't communicate well, management teams say, well, we've got town halls and green room meetings and shift changes and all these meetings we're doing, postings and digital boards, how do we not communicate well? They talk at the employees. Wow. They, they say, right. this is it, I'm the enforcer, here's what's gonna happen. Employees want to actually have a conversation and that's what both of you have talked about. They don't wanna be talked at. Mm -hmm. They wanna have a, you know, an actual conversation is two way. 
Yeah. And so I how do you have I think that focus on the manager is so important. I was talking with uh, a customer recently that was a uh, head of HR at a convenience store chain, regional convenience store chain. I asked him what he's doing, and they're putting in place uh, signing bonuses. They, you know, their starting salary is $15 an hour. Then they had to go to $17 an hour. It's just so hard to attract uh, new employees. And I said, well, what are you doing to train your managers? They're the ones that are going to get their team to stick around. I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, you can throw all the money you want. At Cancel all your meetings this afternoon because <laughs> the conversation's going to go long. Yeah, and it, would, like, it really reinforced the idea that it's, it's such a simple concept, but if you can create great managers, then all of a sudden they will create great employees, and they'll stick around, and they'll tell their friends. Yeah. And Dave, Dave makes a really good point that when, I, when I'm consulting with companies and they say, tell me, recruitment, recruitment, how do I do better? Diversify, how do I, I go, stop. <laughs> What's your retention like? Yeah. Yeah. Because you can bring as many people through the front door as you want, but if there are people going out through the back door, it doesn't even matter. Yeah, we're gonna tap out the community very quickly. <laughs> yeah, and then it becomes your calling card. If you have a good retention, that's your calling card. And that, that's how we increased our employment when I was director of HR at this university was, we knew, we knew our audience, we knew our employees were very familial because of their culture. So we knew if we could get one or two from a family, the rest of the family would come. Sure. Like, and and, and one, some of the ways we did that for Frontline to also say thank you was some of them, English was a second language. So we started with, hey, come work for us at an entry level position. We will have English as a second language course for you during work. We will also teach you computer skills in another class. And then we will also teach you leadership skills so that if you want a career ladder, you can then become a supervisor if it opens. Yeah. And so that helped us. And I got a lot of pushback from other directors going. You're making me look bad. Oh, yeah, no, well, well, no, other directors like the IT, the finance, all yeah. those folks were like, well, they're, and the dy well, they're just going to leave us. We're going to give them all these skills and they're going to leave us. First of all, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Second of all, if it comes your calling card, who cares if they leave you? They're going to tell five of their friends how they got to where they are now. And you're just going to keep your pipeline. I mean, what the, other, the other take of that line I love is I heard someone uh, give that same quote, and the third answer to it is, "What if you don't do it and they stay?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's then you're no. in real trouble. <laughs> it's, 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 we're all passionate about this topic, and I just want to go back to Kylie because I think it's it's so interesting that you were at the front of this thing before we all started to say, "Where's the toilet paper?" Maybe we should be grateful <laughs> for these people. You were grateful for them from the beginning. And the fact that so few people have any gratitude for frontline workers before, during, we're getting towards the end of this, hopefully. You know, are there any lessons learned? Do we need to wait for a crisis to do this? And should we be doing this anyway, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I think you said it. We, sh we should never be waiting for a pandemic or a crisis to recognize and show appreciation for, for so many people that are doing such hard work. I was just reading about a story that went viral on LinkedIn. I don't know if you guys saw this, but a woman recently went through a drive through McDonald's to pick up a Diet Coke, and she ended up telling about the conversation she had with the employee that was working the wind drive through window. And she asked him, how are you? And he, and he was like so taken aback, he said, no one ever asked me how I am, I'm just a McDonald's employee. And she was like, hold the phone, there's no I just anything. I hope she said anything. hold the phone. Yeah. <laughs> she, she said something else, but, but yeah, she was like, there's no just anything. Like she's yeah. like, you They really? couldn't believe mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. someone actually took the time to express kindness and appreciation for someone in a frontline role. And yeah, I mean, there's something wrong with yeah, that. There is. We shouldn't and be telling those stories. We, yeah, you're right. And you know, I think, you know, I worked on the vaccine supply chain manufacturing, essential businesses, food during all this stuff, and I thought I was doing all this stuff. Kylene interacts with more frontline workers than I do, unfortunately. We may have to edit that out. But mm -hmm. she is involved in this stuff all the time. Um, whether it's on Zoom or on the phone or making sure that they have all the tools they need. And so I think it's probably pretty fulfilling for you to believe in this stuff and actually get to work on it all the time. Right. It's probably, it's probably pretty good. So Dave, what, what else should we be talking about around the frontline workforce? Is there, is there another angle that we've forgotten here? I mean, I know that you know, this is a group that will probably be forgotten again in six months. <laughs> you know? So how do we make sure we don't, don't do that? Well, so I think one of the things that Chris brought up that was really interesting that I think we're all going to be talking about soon is getting really creative with your benefits, mm -hmm. right? So what you are doing to, uh, to try to bring those folks in, try to bring their families in, get them 
real genuine training, I feel like everybody's gonna be scrambling to try to think creatively. Because as we've talked about on every single one of these so far, just paying a little bit higher hourly wage, another 25 cents an hour than the next person down the road, not gonna cut it anymore. So I'm curious what you guys have seen in terms of how companies are getting creative around uh, around benefits these days. Yeah, that's a, a great example comes to mind. So um, last year, another study was done, I think recently, that said you know 70% of Americans struggle to pay their bills between paychecks. And I think in terms of benefits and thinking about what's gonna kind of attract people and make them interested in, when you think about compensation, um, providing earned wage access, I think is gonna mm -hmm. be something that we're starting to see a lot more of, but I think it's gonna become the kind of norm in the next mm -hmm. 18 to 24 months. I think people are gonna expect that when they you know, work a day, that they're gonna get access to their money that they earned immediately. Like we're mm -hmm. in a non-demand world with everything else, so I think we're just moving toward that. I think that is fascinating, and I think it's, you know, I was at a manufacturing facility this past week where the employees were saying, are we gonna get paid bi-weekly or are we gonna still do it week to week? And I was thinking that we're going the wrong direction. Right. But I didn't say anything, I said, I'm not here for that. That's what I said, that I was scot-free, but yeah. And, and I, let me dig a little deeper into that. And, it, and it's, I have a presentation coming out next month. And so this is a little bit of a preview because what that, what that tells me is, right? It, and this goes to the whole remote work, hybrid work, work from the office. It also goes to the pay, do you pay bi-weekly, monthly, daily. hourly, daily, right? What actually it boils down to is choice. You're, the benefit you're giving your employees choice, because for some employees, they might not want it. In fact, if you gave me my pay on a daily basis, I will burn through <laughs> it, right? There are some people like that. They'll just burn through it. So getting it every other week is great because now I can budget. Yep. But for others, that might not be appropriate. So what you're doing is you're giving people choice. And as I, I started to peel the onion because everyone was talking about flexibility, so when you peel the onion, it, it became it became this choice. I've been thinking about it for the last two weeks as I've been developing in this new presentation. And if you peel it one more time, it's actually about freedom. You're giving the people the freedom to make their choice, to have the flexibility they want. Now, John's going to steal that idea and it'll be in everyone. His presentation <laughs> from here forward. I, I have, I'm I've already it. texted somebody on the day. <laughs> it's introduction. But the, the freedom piece is interesting. And, you know, Dave and I have debated these issues a lot. And the benefits piece, we keep banging the drum on that and, and the issue for me is and it's again I come from like a more negative side of this because I deal with a lot of restructuring right a lot of businesses are in trouble is wages and benefits typically only go one direction which is up and we talked about it in one of our, our past videos that I get concerned more and more about the threat of automation R robots are not taking over the world however the arbitrage on what's going to be more affordable as the cost of employees becomes more and more expensive automation becomes more attractive the challenge is in a downturn, you can't fire the robots, but you really don't want to fire the people either. No. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, there's some risk here. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, for because I, I, I spent the last 25 years dedicated to hourly employees. I'm concerned mm -hmm. about that risk. Yeah. There's risk, but I think we're, this is all happening at a time. He's when always when more positive than I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening at a time when there's also some demographic risk across the country, right? So there's been a lot of talk about labor participation rates recently. If you actually look at all the, the BLS data, labor participation has been going down for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? It just, it was accelerated during the pandemic and there were a lot more retirements, uh, but this has been going down for 20 years. So that automation is coming right at the time when fewer people are starting to Could work. Could be needed. We need and it anyway. I think it may end up, I will be the positive voice in the room here. <laughs> <laughs> well, does, does, does that get back to the original uh, point about the benefits? For those hourly workers where their jobs could be impacted by automation, yep. are, are we upskilling them for the next role? In like manufacturing, this, the answer is no. Right. We've got millions of... But we, we need to be. But we need to be. Yes, we absolutely. Need to be. We need to be. But there's that's where the retirement skills is. gap, right? Yeah. 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 Is it 2.2 million skills gap or something? Yeah, that's right. And, and so, these are the types yeah. of benefits I think co companies also, while you're building relationships yeah. with your employees, your frontline employees, this allows them to understand that you really do trust them in your best interest by creating benefits or programs to upskill them. Because it, that, that was always the knot, right, on certain generations is, oh, they're only working with us, the millennials aren't gonna be with us for two years. Right. That's it, and they're out. Right. Well, do they have a career ladder to show them yep. that, that there's time that they should be staying in the company? Yeah. There's progression? 
Because if they know what skills they'll learn in a year, two years, three years, they might be they might be hanging out a little bit longer with your company. And then you could retain them, have someone for life. It's your calling card. They tell all their friends, boy, here's a great cycle. I think that cuts across every industry out there, right? You yeah. see that in particular in healthcare. And we've mentioned the manufacturing a couple times, but healthcare is facing the same demographic yeah. issue. And boy, you it's really hard to replace those nurses that are retiring. Like it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, it's so incredible. like we have, in the last two minutes, this is I wanted us to think about this a little bit differently, which is, you know, we're we're you know consultants, experts, we're in the software business, we're in technology. As a consumer, as just a citizen in the United States, just as a citizen, what is the responsibility to show gratitude to these people? And Frankly, you don't even have to be a nice person. <laughs> Do you want toilet paper? Yeah, yeah. Do you want dog food for Max the dog? What do you, you know, what is our responsibility as citizens? I'm gonna, I'll start with you actually, Kylie, and so Dave will take us home. <laughs> uh, well, as an optimist and, and somebody that is, you know, cares about people, I would say we, we have a responsibility as human beings to show appreciation for one another. Um, and I think as so many companies are facing serious labor shortages and skill shortages. Um, it's not just like a nice to do, it's a, it's a must have to, sh to- It's a smart business strategy. Yeah, so you is. can be a good person and make money, is that what you're saying? Exactly. I'm not a misanthrope, by the way, I'm just saying. They're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> so sorry, they're right? not mutually exclusive, <laughs> Chris. Yeah, I, I would say for, for me, you know, the idea of expressing gratitude and thanks to folks is, is a normal human act. I think it's, it's about bringing the whole person to work it's this idea that um, to work is to be human. We all have to do it. Um, and so why not make it the best for everybody? And, and some of that comes like, if you're a manager, the practical thing to do is to schedule some time in your calendar every week that says thank you, so that you can thank one person in your organization for what they do. Yeah. I mean, otherwise it gets pushed aside and you don't remember it. But if it's on your calendar, it gets scheduled. So it's like, that's a practical thing we could be doing. From a corporation standpoint, I like to start, you know, I get caught in the dialogue when I speak about remote versus presence is required work. How, how do we justify one and the other? I go, look, it's the same thing I tell my kids. It's equal versus equitable. My 16 year old can do things my six year old can't, but when she is 16, she can. So it's like, how do we create this equal versus equitable? Can we give them, can we give hourly frontline workers flexible pay, flexible schedules? You know things like that to help them a little bit more yep. with their work and their life, yep. and so how do they and how they negotiate that? And so I mean I, I think there are different ways from a corporation level, from a manager level, and then just from a sheer human level mm -hmm. that we should be acting. The on. human level thing is super yeah. important. So your summary for me is say thank you, especially when it's deserved. Say it thank has you. to be authentic. It has to be, it has to be authentic. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, people thank see you through. for. And then the facts. Yes. And the other one is maybe it's time to fire some of those corporate meetings and administrative meetings that fill up your calendar that frankly don't provide a lot of value. Mm -hmm. So clear the calendar for some better. There's some a better lot activity. of trust there with that. And, and it's something that I push for quite a bit. Do we really need this meeting? Could it have been a report that we just emailed out? Yeah. We, you know, when, when I do meetings, um, just, just because it's really brief, is I don't like all four of us to give an update at the meeting. Mm -hmm write it, send it, and then we'll use the meeting to discuss if I have a question or if I can help, yeah. Or, yeah. as opposed to like verbally just going over my updates. Got it. It's, it's much easier. Totally. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, so the, I think the point I would end on is just be human, mm -hmm. right? This issue that I think there's been this sense that being nice is considered being soft, totally different things, Yeah. Right? <laughs> totally different things. Being nice is not being soft. Being nice is just the right thing to do. And we talked about ESG in our last, uh, in our last video, that is not going away. Mm -hmm. And man, the more you can be nice, there is a double bottom line impact to that that will be more and more measurable over time. It turns out being human takes work though. It, it does. does. You have to be Definitely. very thoughtful about it. Yeah. Absolutely. John, I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dave. Uh, so with that, thanks for taking time with us to talk about this. You two live it every day and we really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Good to be here.